So it's a pleasure to have you for joining us for this important and joyous occasion, uh, both for the Department of Mathematics, the College of Natural Science, and the entire university. Our program today will touch briefly on the creation and importance of these newly established MSU Foundation Professor designation and the long-term impact that these prestigious positions will have on the continued excellence of the university environment. Most importantly, we will hear from the recipient of this professorship, Dr. Andrew Chrisley, and then have his formal investiture as an MSU Foundation professor. Finally, David Washburn, Executive Director for the MSU Foundation, will provide a few closing remarks on how and why these important professorships came into be. Uh, and with that, I've turned the program over to MSU Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies, Stephen Shield. Thank you, Keith. I'm extremely pleased to be here today on behalf of my own office and also uh, Provost UI. We are here to help honor Andrew Chrislieb and to participate in his investiture as an MSU Foundation professor. As most of you know, these MSU Foundation professorships are quite new and they are a very significant addition to our academic community. In its own words, the MSU Foundation serves as a flexible and ongoing resource responsive to the university's strategic needs. In that spirit, and with the Foundation's generous, generous support, award of the MSU Foundation professor title is now being made to select individuals. Each must exhibit externally recognized, exemplary scholarly accomplishment for their career stage. But that by itself is not enough. Each must also offer clear strategic relevance to MSU institutional scholarly needs, disciplinary development, or research and creative emphasis. The goal of the initiative is to enhance the national and international excellence and competitiveness of MSU as an AAU research university and to reinforce the university's status as one of the top 100 research universities in the world. In a few minutes, Professor Promislow, the chair of the math department, will characterize Dr. Chrislieb's career and scholarly contributions. I will content myself with stating that Andrew is among an outstanding group of MSU scholars who contribute at an extraordinary level to the search for new knowledge. As a result, he is highly influential both nationally and internationally. He is a role model to junior faculty, and he creates an environment of excellence that attracts peers from other institutions to work with him. Thanks to funding from the MSU Foundation and the College of Natural Science, as well as the Provost, the university will provide temporary support for his research and permanent recognition of his achievement. Ultimately, we hope his presence and example will inspire others, MSU friends, donors, and alumni, to provide permanent funding in the form of endowments to support all of our top scholars in perpetuity. This is a great day. And with colleagues such as Dr. Chris Lee, I believe MSU can look forward to many more. Thank you very much. Okay, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Jim uh, Dean Jim Kirkpatrick, who's going to talk about the significance of this for the for the the college. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Keith, and. Uh, Welcome everybody to, uh, to uh, this event. It's great to see everybody here and thank you all for coming. So I really have one important job today and that is to congratulate Andrew and thank him for everything he's done for the university. So Andrew, on behalf of the college, congratulations. Thanks. It's great working with you. The other thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the importance of these uh, endowed faculty positions because they, they really are uh, critical to the advancement of the of the university. Uh, the, the hallmark of great universities, all great universities have these things and I want to talk a little bit about what they do. So from the individual standpoint, what do they do? Well, give you some money that is really important and, and most people who have these things will use that money uh, in, in multiple ways that really enhance their, their, their research program. Use it to, to start projects that uh, maybe they don't have funding for yet that, that, that can become funded, or to support graduate students, support, in, not in, in mathematics case, but in, 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 in laboratory sciences, have, have a laboratory manager. The kinds of things that are the 
the difference to, to really uh, provide excellence for the institution and for the individual's, uh, individual's research and, and, and career path. You also put this title on your letterhead. And, you know, when you're a uh, Michigan State University Foundation professor, um, people listen to you more. That's just, just, the, way the, just the way the world works. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not just prestige within the institution, but uh, gives the person you know, more capacity to influence the world. From, from the university standpoint, why is this important? Well, the university is, is the people, right? So, so it's an opportunity for us to recognize our most outstanding faculty members, really important, to, to allow them to, uh, to have influence outside the, outside the university, increased influence. Um, and and uh, it also plays an important role in, uh, in retaining and and bringing in new faculty. Uh, and it, they also play an important role in, um, in, in, in bringing in outstanding graduate students and postdocs and other faculty members. Other, you know, people want to be near other, other accomplished people. And, and uh, you know, these, these uh, uh, name positions play an important role there. They do, however, come with high expectations. <laughs> and uh, expectations for outstanding research, expectations for outstanding education, but as importantly, expectations for leadership of the institution, senior faculties and especially uh, named, named uh, uh, faculty members play a really critical role in the leadership of the, of, of the institution, the development of the institution. And in this case, it's a great pleasure to be able to say that Andrew has, has already succeeded at this uh, uh, in, a, in a very terrific way. He's been, been uh, one of the main drivers for the formation of the new Department of Computational Math, Science, and Engineering, uh, will be the, uh, the founding chair of that department. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to uh, great things from, from the uh, from the development of that department. So again, Andrew, thank you very much. Congratulations, and uh, it's a great day. Thanks. It's my pleasure to be able to add the perspective of the Department of Mathematics uh, on the important occasion of Andrew Chris Lieb's investiture uh, as an MSU Foundation professor. Uh, it's something I feel very personally connected to. I, I, uh, bringing Andrew to MSU was something, uh, uh, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, Andrew's research pushes the frontiers of computational methods with the goal of making an impact on real world problems, problems that you can understand, you can explain to people as you're walking down the street. His style, which is, I think, unique and hopefully able to be duplicated on a department scale, dates back to his days as a postdoctoral fellow. Andrew was investigating uh, spurious numerical uh, heating effects uh, caused by particle and cell methods for kinetic problems related to nuclear fusion. Uh, Andrew really came up with, a, I think, a very pioneering approach. Uh, he used, sort of introduced the idea of grid-free grid methods for these plasma simulations uh, on the scale. And the, the, the result of this, the, the, the acclaim, earned him both an Air Force, uh, OSR, and an Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award. Uh, since then, Andrew has continued in this, in this vein. He's branched out. He's become a world leader in the development of higher order methods that make the next generation problems in plasma physics, material science, combustion, magnetohydrodynamics. I just like to show I can say that word on demand. <laughs> and render them computable. That's really an admirable, ad, admirable goal, a valuable goal. But you would misunderstand Andrew if you only looked at his technical work if you missed his human impact. The six or seven PhD students who are sitting over there, the four or five postdoctoral fellows uh, that are annually populating his world that he works with, Andrew is in his element when he is nurturing talent. There is no one I have met 
who cares more, does more, gives more to their students. And they love and respect him for it. But still, first and foremost, to understand Andrew, is to understand that Andrew Chris Lieb is a builder. A wise proverb holds that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Andrew's approach is more like, hey guys, let's build a lighthouse. Come on, I'll get together, get some bricks, let's build it, it's gonna be big. This tremendous enthusiasm, this vision on the future, always looking towards the future. He has a vision of mathematics that reaches out across this campus, across all disciplines, across this country. And in tireless pursuit of this goal, he has achieved what few, very few do. He has built a new department, Department of Computational Mathematics, Science, and Engineering, a department that will serve as a beacon to guide our way into the future. On that note, let's hear what Andrew has to say about the exciting work he's doing. Andrew Chrisley. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to start out by thanking the foundation and the university for their recognition. It means a lot to me. It's really going to impact my work in big ways. Jim mentioned a lab manager, and that's actually how I intend to use the, work, the, the money is to actually provide a lab manager for my research group. So it's a, it's a big deal for us. Um, so I'm going to talk about the role of computing a little bit in society in general, and then I'm going to talk briefly about one of the problems we're looking at. My group is relatively large. I have seven math students, and I have three engineering students, and we tend to look at a lot of different problems because we have a lot of different interests. So I'm going to focus in on, on one piece as we go along here. Um, so what is computing? Computing is an essential part of society around us. It's an important part of the STEM disciplines. Uh, computational science has developed into its own, a discipline in its own right. It really represents sort of a, the third leg of science as things stand. And computational tools are really a key in the 21st century for helping us do scientific discovery in many areas, uh, from biology, where we're looking at genomics, through uh, physical sciences, where we're trying to understand the origins of the universe, to modeling and simulating uh, how we build and design computer chips. Computing all pl plays a critical role in every part of these, uh, in uh, every part of these scientific endeavors. Um, I like a tongue-in-cheek description of computing because, frankly, I think it's good to bring a little levity to the situation. I like to say computing is when pen and paper are no longer the right way to go. So really, it's, it's when the problem becomes so big that to really tackle the problem, you have to bring to bear tools of, sci uh, of scientific computing to the problem, use the computer to help you analyze the problem. And so what does it mean to bring computing to analyze a problem? Well, you have to have knowledge of the application you care about. Because if you don't understand the application you're trying to study, you're probably not trying to develop the right tools, understand the right behavior for the problem you're looking at. So you have to have application knowledge. You need knowledge of computer science, that is, how are you going to trans, how are you going to program and, and represent things in the computer? And you need mathematical skills, you need approximation theory to say, how do I take this problem and best approximate in what the computer can do? The computer can really do four things well. It adds, it subtracts, it divides, it multiplies. Everything else we make it do is based on really those sorts of skills that it can do. And so really translating models into something that can be represented in that way is where mathematics comes in. So the goals of what I do, I, my group focuses on sort of three areas. One is um, membrane science. So membranes uh, are used in many aspects of science and technology in fuel cells, batteries, and in solar cells, they're what's called a separator membrane. The, these are functionalized polymers that let electrons go one way and ions have to go a different way, and so you get current drawn through this, driven through the system. And so this is really how you develop models that accurately describe the morphology and accurately describe their behavior is one of the things I'm interested in. The same sorts of models also play a role in biological applications, so I'm interested in how these models play a role in things like lipid bilayers. Um, another area, the area that I got my start in that we work in is plasma science. And what I'm really interested in is how plasmas can be used to affect the world around us, improve the world around us. Everything from spacecraft propulsion systems through building better fuel systems for jet engines, plasmas actually can play an important role in these sorts of systems. And so I, I work in plasma science is one of the main areas we focus on. And then it turns out that related to computing, um, because as we move to large-scale computing, 
we end up with such massive amounts of data. Right now, I'm working with the uh, Oak Ridge Research Lab, and they're working on kinetic simulations where one time step of the simulation generates about four petabytes of data. That's an amazing amount of data. And how do you even sift through that data to find the essential information? So data science is crossing over and playing a really important role, not only through society in general, but in scientific computing, we try to do large scale computing. Data science is playing a really important role there as well. And so these are things that I care about and I work on. And so, so what does my group do? My research group works on developing new computational methods that help give a better understanding of the world around us for problems that we're, we're barely starting to understand right now. So I'm going to talk about one of these problems right now. It's a correlated plasma. So first of all, to understand the problem, you have to know what a plasma is. <laughs> to understand the problem, you need to know uh, what does it mean to be correlated, and then who cares? Why do we care about this, right? So that's really, that's the three things I want to say in the next couple of slides. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Ying Da Chen and John Verbancourt, and then Gotem and Mir are two of the students in engineering that are helping with this work. So let's start with a simple topic of what is a plasma. Uh, you start with a solid and you add energy and it melts into a liquid, okay? And if you heat it up more, you add more heat, it, breaks, it evaporates into a gas. And if you add even more energy, what happens is the gas molecules themselves, the, the, the fundamental molecule breaks down and separates. So you end up with ions and electrons, the charged particles floating around as a gas. That's a plasma, all right? It's, physicists like to refer to it as the fourth state of matter. It's 99% of the visible universe. When you look at the night sky, at, when you look at the sky at night, it's 99% of what you see is in the plasma state. Um, to give you a, a sort of a reference for understanding, it's hard to understand when you add more energy, what does that really mean? So if you talk about a, a, a laboratory plasma, we're gonna go in the lab and we're gonna make an argon plasma. Um, an argon plasma is where you add, take an electromagnetic wave and you add a lot of energy and force the gas to break down. The temperature of a laboratory plasma is typically for the electrons around three electron volts. One electron volt is 10,000 Kelvin. So it's really, really, really hot. There's a lot of energy in the system. You could ask, why doesn't it just melt the system and evaporate? Because 30,000 Kelvin should melt any metal, right? That would be what you would think. Turns out that typically when we talk about laboratory plasmas, they're so dilute that the amount of energy that they impact the side of the system is so little that none of this stuff melts. And so this is, this is but laboratory plasmas are an important part of science. They're actually, this sort of stuff is where I got my start is actually studying how we manufacture computer chips. So laboratory plasmas play a really critical role in understanding how we manufacture computer chips. So uh, what is a correlated plasma? So I've described what a plasma is. So let's start out with what, uh, what we're, what, how we're gonna make the plasma. We're gonna do something a little bit crazy. We're gonna take a gas and we're gonna cool it down to 0.1 Kelvin. And in doing so, the matter is gonna change state and it's gonna form what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. So what you will have is you'll have a collection of, of bosons that collapse down. So the matter is gonna change from being, uh, instead of like a frozen solid, it's gonna collapse down. You'll get this core of bosons with a cloud of fermions around the outside. So it's actually gonna change from the way we think of matters of being ions and electrons to being this different state of matter. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a laser and we're gonna try and separate the electrons from, the, from that cloud by just adding enough energy to force it to ionize. And in doing so, what we form is what, uh, uh, we form a plasma where the ions are 0.1 Kelvin. And zero Kelvin is absolute zero in the universe, right? So we're talking very cold plasma. And then we're gonna add one, and the electrons in it are one Kelvin of energy. So that, that are, so they're very cold as well, but they're enough that they actually act a little bit thermal. And so what's interesting about this system is that there's more potential energy than kinetic energy. So what is potential energy? You think about a ball, a ball at the top of a hill, when it sits at the top of the hill, that's its potential energy. When it rolls down and it's rolling, that's its kinetic energy. So this system has a lot of potential energy, not kinetic energy. And what that means is the system actually tends to behave very <coughs> correlated, that ions tend to act and as a bulk, they tend to behave as a rigid body motion. Even though they're a separated gas, they have very different dynamics when we think about gas molecules in the air. And so the, the question, an important part of this problem is that electromagnetic waves do not couple in ways that we understand well to these correlated plasmas. And so why would you care about why, why would I care about trying to couple an electroma electromagnetic wave to this correlated plasma? Well, okay, let's talk about a completely different problem, which is the motivation for the problem I'm looking at, <laughs> okay? The completely different problem is if you consider a solar flare from the sun, all right? 
So the sun has uh, these big solar flares, and what happens is energetic particles from these solar flares get trapped in the Earth's ionosphere and bounce back and forth between the poles. And this is due to the Lorentz force. They get trapped on the magnetic field lines of the Earth, and they go back and forth. These energetic particles, with a big solar eruption, if it actually was to happen where one was to hit the Earth, those energetic particles would destroy modern communication satellites within a matter of hours. And so, who cares about this? The telecom industry, those of us who like our cell phone, like I like to talk on my cell phone, I like to do all sorts of stuff on the internet, I care about whether this actually happens. So what you want to do is you want to think about, is there a way that you could prevent these energetic particles from destroying the satellites? Well, okay, there is a possible solution, which is to try and use energetic electromagnetic waves to knock those particles that are trapped on the Earth's magnetic, uh, on the Earth's magnetic field into what's called the loss cone. If you can knock them into the loss cone, they'll drift down and they won't impact our satellites. They'll actually burn up coming into the Earth's atmosphere. So you, if you could couple the magnetic waves into the ionosphere, uh, and you could knock these energetic particles out of, the, out of the magnetic field. The problem is that the Earth's magnetic field is full of dust. And why does that matter? Because dust charges up negatively. And the dust charges up negatively, negatively, and it's very heavy. And it starts to look like that ultra-cold plasma I was talking about. Very big, very, very heavy, very slow-moving particles with lots of charge. And the energetic ions look like, now that we've reversed the roles, they look like the electrons. In fact, it is a correlated plasma. It behaves very dynamically like a correlated plasma. So who cares about this? Well, all sorts of people in telecommunications, as well as the Air Force, really care about this. How do I couple electromagnetic waves into this correlated plasma to knock these energetic particles into the loss cones? So they're not going to destroy my satellites. So why are we looking at all, why are we looking at say uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate turned into a plasma instead of the dust particle? Well, it's really really hard to model a dusty plasma well, and so we're trying to understand the fundamental process of how you how you connect electromagnetic waves to a correlated plasma. So we're looking at a laboratory setting where we can actually do very accurate modeling. In the case of a Bose-Einstein condensate, there are so few ions that we can actually model each particle within the system individually. It's a very, very small system from what we're used to talking about. So since we can model every particle individually, and there are very, very good laboratory benchmarks, we're trying to build a virtual laboratory so we can understand the impact of correlation in these systems to try and develop more coarse-grained models that would allow us to model larger systems that include that correlation in them. And so we're trying to start at the small level and build up to the larger level to try and tackle this bigger problem. And so that's really what this is being motivated by. So my group does a lot of things. Um, in particular, we look at uh, functionalized polymers, we look at inert gas lasers, we look at plasma-assisted combustion, we look at modeling correlated plasmas, we look at data science tools for representing, uh, for, for minimal representation, we look at next generation HPC kind of tools, high performance computing and multi-scale physics problems, and we look at scale bridging numerical methods. And all of this is really trying to tackle very big problems, but we're trying to take it one piece at a time, working on better tools, better numerical methods, and trying to do it very systematically with the hope of making a big impact in the end. And so with that, I'd like to put up a slide of all the people who do the really hard work, which are my students. <laughs> and so these are my current students uh, in mathematics and engineering and my current postdocs. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Our next, uh, our next event is the presentation of the uh, medallion by Stephen Shue. Solid gold. <laughs> so I have the honor of, uh, of wrapping this up, and um, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you. I, I have a bunch of words I need to go look up now when I get back to my office. Uh, but I wanted to start by just saying that um, a few words about the MSU Foundation and uh, how this foundation professorship came to be. Um, very briefly, the MSU Foundation was created in the early 70s. We're a separate legal entity that sits outside the university, and we are the custodians, if you will, of uh, a big pile of money that came from 
inventions from uh, our faculty here at MSU. Uh, and we invest that money and the proceeds that we make from that money uh, are, are given back to the university for a lot of things. And uh, that's, that's what we do and that's why we're here. And so um, the, the invention that, that is the foundation of the MSU uh, corpus is a, uh, a cancer therapeutic. It was invented in the 70s. It was patented and then licensed to a pharmaceutical company. And we received about 350 million in royalties uh, from, from that. And I'd like to say that, you know, not many people know this, but um, universities uh, uh, having that kind of a home run with a tech transfer story, it's pretty rare. Um, Stanford had something called Yahoo and Google. Uh, the Nicorette patch came out of UCLA um, that made them a bunch of money. Uh, Florida has this drink called Gatorade, which they make a lot of money. But it's very, very rare. Uh, for uh, universities to have that kind of a, uh, a huge impact and a huge fund available. And so really at the foundation, we're, we're kind of a strategic weapon, as uh, Steve talked about, a strategic and flexible resource uh, that we, uh, we are here to help make MSU a better place. So we invest our money in things like uh, the Patent Office and uh, uh, Spartan Innovations. We have a company called uh, MBI. We have a research park, and that's that's really who who we are. And uh, some of my colleagues are here from the foundation, so hopefully uh, we'll get to see them. So when I think of the foundation, I, I think we're we're uh, kind of like that little drawing here. We're we're a big ball of potential energy, and uh, what we do is is, is turn it into kinetic energy. And uh, so that's about the best I can come up with, Andrew. Giving you so. So the way this came to be, I, I've been here a little over a year, and, um, and when I arrived, um, there was this talk, and, and really Steve Shu was the lead, and Steve and many of his colleagues had uh, asked this question, you know, how do we go about recognizing our, 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 our best and our brightest? Uh, how do we make sure that we retain them, and how do we attract more of the best and the brightest? And that's really how this MSU Foundation professorship came to be. Uh, and, and so we're just thrilled to uh, be in the position to, uh, you know, to make the funds available uh, for this, this to happen. And that's really our job. That, that, that's, why, that's why we exist. Um, I think that's about all I have on that. So uh, I want to thank you and I want to congratulate you, Andrew, uh, on, this, on this award. Um, and before we... Uh, adjourn to the next room. I understand we've got a photographer who's going to come up here and take charge, and the desserts are going to be correlated plasmas, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Val. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you all very much for coming, and congratulations again, Andrew.